So welcome everybody. We're excited to have you here today. I'm Dr. Lauren Schumacher, one of the CAP psychiatrists, and I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Donnie and Dr. Curso here to talk to you about eating disorders in primary care. So Dr. Amanda Downey is a pediatrician and psychiatrist. Um, she is the assistant medical director of the UCSF eating disorders program. She earned her medical degree at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and um, attended the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center for residencies in pediatrics and adult psychiatry and a fellowship in child psychiatry. And Dr. Accurso is assistant associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry, where she serves as the clinical director of the UCSF Eating Disorders Program. Um, she attained her PhD in clinical psychology from San Diego State University, University of California, um, and also a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago. And we're Mark, so excited to have you throughout. Um, if you guys have questions that come up, please feel free to put those in the Q and A or chat, and we'll do our best to address those at the end. Great, thanks, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. We have no relationships, uh, financial relationships to do disclose. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Um, thanks for being here today. This is, I know, Erin and I, this is our, one of our favorite things to do um, is to talk to pediatricians about how to take really good care of these patients. And you guys are just critical partners with us in taking really good care of these patients. So um, again, just, just thank you for being here. What do we know about eating disorders? Eating disorders lead to severe medical consequences, including death. And so that's why as a primary care provider, I know sometimes it's just like, oh gosh, you just want to refer and get them to the specialist, but really with your medical head on, you truly are a critical partner um, in the treatment of these patients and, and avoiding really irreversible medical consequences, again, even including death. So the mortality in anorexia nervosa, just to hammer this home, is actually really high. Our patients, um, you know, go on to have significant medical comorbidity, but in terms of mortality, we're looking at six to eight percent, with some studies even citing up to ten percent. That's one of the highest mortality rates of any psychiatric diagnosis, more than double that of schizophrenia, and almost triple that of either bipolar or major depressive disorder. And when you look at the epidemiology of this, about a third of deaths in anorexia are due to suicide, or I'm sorry, due to heart problems, and about a fifth due to suicide. So it really is this kind of scary uh, middle ground between medical complexity and psychiatric complexity. And so really, really important to pay attention to both pieces there. I would also just highlight, right, that this mortality rate actually exceeds that of like ALL, right, the most common childhood cancer. And so for me, that really helps frame this diagnosis. If you have a new patient with a new cancer diagnosis, it's full stop, full court press, total paradigm shift for that family, right? Going in to really kind of battle cancer. And I'm gonna argue that we need to have kind of that same orientation to our patients with anorexia nervosa because of this really high mortality, right? It's interesting because the psychological eating disorder symptoms we see, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, cognitive rigidity, compulsions, this really unbelievably fixed distress around body image, most of those symptoms are influenced by malnutrition itself. And so one of these really pivotal points that you can intervene for your patients is to really reinforce the importance of re-nourishing um, the young person, the patient, really being a good advocate for early and aggressive weight restoration. We'll talk about what that looks like. So important to know that a diagnosis is not necessary. It's not necessary in your practice, and it's definitely not necessary to refer for special eating disorder treatment. What is your job then, right? We want to identify concerning growth patterns, concerning behaviors, being able to initiate that first pass medical management, right? Labs, height, weight, vital signs, recognizing when someone is super sick and needs to go to the hospital versus someone who can be managed in the outpatient setting. And again, putting in that referral if and when it's appropriate. 
So what are some good screening questions to pick this up? You know, there are many validated screeners. One you might have heard of during medical school or training was the scoff is something that that is commonly taught in more formal curriculums. I think Dr. Accurso and I are going to make the argument that actually just kind of using your intuition and your humanity in picking up these patients actually counts for a whole heck of a lot. Asking things like just really open-ended, right? How is your eating? How's nutrition going? How important to you is what you eat? I think a really good flip of this is what percentage of your day are you kind of thinking about food or your body? That just gives you kind of a really nice, quick, quick and dirty litmus test as to how much this is influencing the young person. Are you on a diet? Are you trying to lose weight? How did you start that process? Have you lost any weight recently? How much? What, what was your goal? What were you trying to do or accomplish by losing weight? Are you weighing yourself every day? How do you feel about your body? How do you feel about your weight, right? So like not to belabor the point, but again, just, just bringing kind of your most transparent self to that encounter to ask, because when your spidey senses are up that there's something going wrong, probably there is, and it's worth asking about. Um, another one I would add to this, particularly during the pandemic is, is what social media are you looking at? We know that many of our young people because of the crazy algorithm um, have kind of gone down a rabbit hole of uh, diet and exercise through different and various social media platforms. So that's also a good question to ask. So these diagnoses are really evolving, right? In the wake of this new, the DSM-5 coming out in 2013, um, there are lots of different names for these, all these different diagnoses. And again, I just want to take that pressure off of you that you do not have to make a diagnosis and it's okay. And certainly there are more diagnoses than what are listed on this slide. Things like um, PICA, rumination disorder, night eating syndrome. Again, it's really picking up any medical ramifications and any concerning behaviors. And if you've done that, that is a job well done. Absolutely. So as pediatricians, you are experts in growth and development. And that is one of the reasons that we often will ask um, our PCP colleagues for their growth charts, right? Because we know that you've been tracking and tracking along. Um, so something that's used in the eating disorder world is what's called the median uh, BMI or, or the, the percent of median BMI. And that's just a way to really standardize degrees of malnutrition. It's just based on CDC growth curves, looking at national averages by, um, by sex and by gender. Um, and again, is a way to quantify malnutrition. But I'm going to argue that this is getting a little bit outdated in clinical practice. It's a really good research metric. But right, what we know know is that patients grow along their own curve. Someone who's at the 85th percentile and they've been there since toddlerhood, that's an appropriate kind of curve for them, right? Similarly, patients who have been growing at the fifth or the 10th percentile their entire life, that's also an appropriate percentile for them. Of course, there are minor deviations, bumps in the road, changes with puberty. Those things are all to be expected. But again, just to keep a really keen eye on that growth curve and, and knowing that patients should by and large follow their own curve. Oops, this animation didn't go quite according to plan. <laughs> Sorry, guys, but um, essentially, Sorry. that's okay, no, my fault. Um, the point of that slide was to say, um, oh, here, this works. Um, so falling off the BMI curve, obviously, this is total red flag for malnutrition or an eating disorder, right? Someone who's clearly been growing along that 50th percentile and is now underweight. We're, we're, we're probably going to call that classic anorexia nervosa uh, without any other context. Similarly here, right? Someone who is always underweight and is now under the growth curve, that's anorexia nervosa. Now this one, right? This is a young person who is growing along the 85th percentile, right? So we could, um, depending on the weight, we might even categorize this as, as overweight. This young person has the onset of eating disorder behaviors and loses weight rapidly, but makes it to the 50th percentile. And again, if we look at national standards, that's, that's a normal BMI, right? Or a normal weight. But what's really important to know about these patients in larger bodies is that that weight loss, that degree of weight suppression is what we call it, means that they are just as medically and psychologically impaired as those young people who are considered, again, classically underweight. And so look out for those people, those patients in larger bodies go missed, but again, they're just as medically and psychologically compromised. 
So another concern, I think, Aaron, you can click again. Um, it's, it's just a flat BMI curve, right? I think when you're, you know, pounding out 20 patients a day and, and you don't see that curve fall off, you see it stay stable. It's really, uh, it's kind of tempting to just scroll through and be like, fine, 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 nothing wrong, right? But remember, if the young person is gaining height, these pathways, a flat BMI curve, or even just a barely increased BMI curve, is probably going to indicate weight loss. So again, just, just kind of watching out for, um, for red flags there. So how do we kind of talk about degrees of malnutrition? And, and I think there are more and more markers as we go along. Um, but we think of this in terms of mild, moderate, and severe categories. Again, you'll see that we use this percent medium BMI at the top. I'm going to ask you to, to kind of ignore that. You can certainly use Z-scores. But then look at this one, weight loss. This is just percentage or degree of how much of your own or pre-morbid body weight that you've lost. That's a really salient marker that will capture all, almost all of your patients with malnutrition. Um, and so I, I would encourage you to just do a quick and dirty calculation of that if you're concerned and want to kind of categorize the degree of malnutrition. So let's just give an example. We're going to talk about two young people, birth assigned females that both have weight loss secondary to a diagnosed eating disorder. Both are about 16, both are about 5'5", five, five, and they've lost significant weight. So let's talk about Jill. Jill has classic kind of restrictive type anorexia nervosa. She goes from 125 pounds to 85 pounds, which is a BMI of 14. So that's severe malnutrition. If you're just, again, looking at those curves or looking at that percentage of median BMI, that represents a 40 pound weight loss. Compare that to Jane who's been diagnosed with atypical anorexia nervosa. She started at a pre-morbid weight of about 260 pounds. And I'm going to interject this, this little piece, right? Maybe she's been told by her pediatrician for a long time that she needs to lose weight. She loses weight to 128 pounds, which puts her at a BMI of about 21.3. That's considered again, against national standards, right? A normal BMI, maybe folks have encouraged her weight loss, tell her she looks good or looks healthy. And that represents a 132 pound weight loss. So are these girls equally malnourished is the question. <laughs> So this is where that variable comes in of weight suppression, really simple calculation, the highest historical weight minus the weight at presentation divided by again, the highest historical weight. And that gives you this really nice percent to say just how severely malnourished is this young person. So you can see Jill again, this classified as, as classically underweight, had a 40 pound weight loss is 32% weight suppressed and compare that, um, to Jane, right, who had 132 pound weight loss and is 51% suppressed. She lost 51% of her body weight. That's really profound. So again, why do we care about this piece? It's because weight suppression predicts illness severity. And that's actually research that was done here at UCSF in 2018 and 2019. It's weight suppression, how far you fell off your curve that's associated with more severe bradycardia, persistent amenorrhea, lower metabolic markers like thyroid studies, and again, actually worse eating disorder psychopathology or more distress around food, body image, anxiety, depression, et cetera. That's why we look at that metric. Rapidity of weight loss is another kind of predictive um, factor of severity. And so again, you don't need to spend time calculating this. I know everyone's seeing like 20 plus patients in a day, but just to keep in mind, right? Was there a, a precipitous, are we talking 10 pounds of weight loss in a month or 10 pounds over six months? Either way, I don't like it. Young people should be growing, right? Any weight loss is concerning, um, but you can kind of factor that into your decision-making when you're thinking about how severe this young person might be. Um, just a quick nod to rapid weight gain, which can also represent an eating disorder that has binging as a component, right? The classic one being binge eating disorder. Um, but you can also see curves like this. In <laughs> just to keep an eye on that. Again, not necessarily that you have to make a referral, but you might want to think about other medical workups, referrals for therapy, et cetera. 
And remember, normal growth doesn't rule out an eating disorder. You can still meet criteria for disordered eating or a formal eating disorder, even if your growth curves are beautiful and classic like this one we see here along that 75th percentile. I actually spend a, a decent amount of time in my practice just kind of validating that beh the behaviors and the thoughts themselves are really worthy of interdisciplinary gold standard treatment. It's not acceptable to me if a young person has 75% of their cognitive space taken up by eating disorder thoughts. Um, and it, it's okay to say that to patients and families as well. So what does kind of a basic initial medical evaluation look like? So certainly height and weight in a gown, right? Again, you guys are experts in tracking uh, growth and development. And so getting a really accurate sense of, of the young person's status, super important. Vital signs, including orthostatic measurements. Orthostatics um, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. So I'll just share with you how we do them here at UCSF. We have the young person um, lay down for five minutes, then take a pulse and a blood pressure, stand up for two minutes, and then repeat those metrics. And we're looking at the difference. Um, I think occasionally we see folks do lying sitting standing, which um, is, is totally fine in certain contexts that just in the case of malnutrition, just harder to interpret when you throw in that sitting piece as well. Um, a really good history and physical exam. We've already talked through some of the kind of questions to ask. Um, and, and remember the eating disorders and malnutrition are really a, a multi-organ disease. You can see effects on every single part of the body. And so that initial um, physical exam can be really crucial. Um, a careful review of growth charts. Again, there's some interesting studies to suggest that even small deviations in the growth curve before the young person has brought up anything about their disordered eating did in fact indicate risk or true diagnosis of eating disorder. So again, just to be really attuned to growth curves and picking up or, or going with your spidey senses when, when you are sensing any red flags. Um, EKG. Yeah, there, there's some interesting questions in the chat about, you know, how, how do you differentiate between what would be considered a healthy weight um, or healthy weight loss for someone who has overweight or obesity versus uh -huh. someone who has an eating disorder? And, you know, also some questions about what would, what would healthy growth curve look like for someone um, who has overweight, who's losing weight in a, you know, quote unquote, healthy way. Totally. And um, I wonder if you might address some of those. <laughs> or gosh, you guys, these are, the end. these are such good questions. <laughs> and Erin, um, you can probably back me up. This would be a whole nother talk. <laughs> so I'm going to put the fifth a little bit, but I am going to just remind that young people should be growing and young people, again, with small deviations should be following their growth curves. And so for me, Anytime we are dipping off the growth curve, I am concerned. And that's even in my patients that are considered overweight and obese. Again, thinking about that weight suppression metric, right? Um, and so I know that that's not a, a perfect answer um, because certainly we know that there are real medical and psychological ramifications of being overweight as well. I think maybe a more interesting question is how do we help our patients in larger bodies who need to lose weight? how do we help them do that without causing or predisposing to an eating disorder, right? And we're seeing more and more emerging research in that area, but I would encourage um, staying away from weight talk and body talk and number talk and focusing and encouraging on things like joyful, purposeful movement of the body because it feels good and it brings you joy. Um, focusing on things like family dinners, right? Not eating in front of the TV, but eating collaboratively and socially with peers and family and friends. Um, and I'm, there's actually a really good article about that in pediatrics that I'd be happy to send out to everyone um, after this talk. Um, but I apologize for skirting the question a little bit. Erin, anything else that I missed? Um, there was also a question about whether T3 is typically checked for uh, yeah. eating disorder patients. Yeah, it's a good question. We're going to talk about labs. Uh, no, I typically I'm ordering um, a TSH that a UCSF will reflex to a, a free T4 if necessary. T3 for now at least is much more of a research metric. Yeah, it's a great question. Okay, good. Um, let's keep let's keep cranking then, Erin. Thanks. Those are great questions, guys. I appreciate it. So what are the medical tests we do? Again, we get an EKG again, because of that really high cardiac, um, 
uh, comorbidity that we see in our patients and, and being a risk factor for death. So we're looking for sinus bradycardia, right? That we see that increased vagal or parasympathetic tone, um, in the setting of malnutrition, we call it hibernation mode. The body's just slowing down to conserve energy. We're also looking for things like prolonged QTC, any arrhythmia, heart block. Um, those are really common complications and definitely a reason to just get on the phone with our on-call docs. Um, if you have any concerns. I'm going to run through our initial kind of lab screen really quick to tell you just a couple interesting findings you might see on these labs. So when you're getting a CBC, leukopenia is by far and away the most common abnormality we see in anorexia nervosa, and you will even see pretty impressive neutropenia. So you can use that with families, right, to make this case that this is a really serious illness. Your child is so malnourished that their bone marrow can't even pump out the blood cells that they need to fight infection. On the CMP, certainly we're looking for electrolytes, especially if there's purging going on, right? That, that presents imminent danger. The other interesting finding you might see are elevated liver enzymes, which we think is part and parcel of hypoperfusion of the liver from malnutrition or just autophagy, right? The body is so desperate for energy that it's actually eating itself to release energy stores um, again to the brain and to the heart. Lipid panel, really interesting. We will see elevated cholesterol and triglycerides for these patients. And we don't want families to think, oh my gosh, you're telling me my kid has an eating disorder, but they have high cholesterol. What's up with that? That is also the body releasing those fatty acids into the bloodstream, again, to get to your brain and your heart to keep vital organs functioning. So it's okay to lean into that. Um, ESR, CRP, TTG, and IgA, what are we doing? We're ruling out things like IBD and celiac disease as a, as a secondary cause of malnutrition. Again, you don't want to miss those medical pieces, right? So, so do make sure you keep your medical hat on when you're seeing these patients. Zinc and vitamin D, really common deficiencies in our patients with malnutrition, easy to supplement, and may also help with some of the mental health pieces. Um, so just easy, low-risk interventions. And then again, TSH, which we already talked about. Um, Amanda, there was a question about whether you stagger, so whether you do those um, those labs first, look at electrolytes first before doing an EKG, oh. um, as, well, and as well as a question about, you know, what range of BMI would you recommend to do an EKG right away? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I would say it kind of depends on your clinic flow. Like when I'm doing an initial eval, I'm ordering the labs and ordering the EKG at that same visit. Um, in like one of the clinics I run, we don't have a lab on site, so they might go that afternoon or the next day, right? But they can get the EKG. Um, so I, I would say it's up to your practice, but it, it's just nice to go ahead and have them both. More, more information is better at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of prioritizing or based on BMI, for me, if there's any weight loss, I, I just get the EKG because I'd rather be safe than sorry. So no, no strict uh, BMI criteria for getting that test. Um, back to the urine sample. So what am I looking for? Um, we don't do a clean catch. You could if you wanted to, and that's just your clinic's practice. But the things I'm looking for are specific gravity. I'm looking for dehydration, which, which could be a reason to send someone to the ER, right? Or on the flip side, many of our patients have eating disorders that make them water load or take in a bunch of water before the appointment in order to show a falsely elevated weight range, right? Our patients are often fiercely protective of their eating disorder. And this is one way that they you know, the eating disorder can kind of evade detection, right? So if there's a really low specific gravity on the urine, I might be concerned for that behavior and more likely to insist on getting electrolytes that day. Again, I'm worried about things like hypoglycemia and even hyponatremic seizure. Um, urine drug screen, you know, pregnancy tests, certainly if those make sense clinically, um, you, you are welcome to get those as well. The other way that you can be really amazing partners with us in the care of these young people is if you're seeing someone who's lost their period for six months because of malnutrition, we know that that's a long enough period without that good, robust estrogen protection of the bones that we might be starting to see osteopenia or even osteoporosis. And so um, referring for a DEXA scan at that point can be really helpful um, in the management of these patients. So just to kind of summarize your role as primary care providers, really important to say food is the best medicine. This process is hard. 
And we must, must weight restore, not only for medical stability, but we know when we pursue early and aggressive weight restoration, that psychological piece improves too. Um, and families and patients will need a lot of reminders of that. Um, so you can be good partners um, by kind of mirroring that language. We need to mobilize caregiver involvement, right? I, I use that act, that cancer, um, kind of illusion that I did at the beginning of the talk. I use that with patients and families too, right? This is a highly deadly disease. We need to treat it as if your young person has cancer. Um, and, and that just helps to increase engagement. Erin will spend a little bit more time on that piece. Um, stabilizing, of course, any abnormal vital signs or electrolytes, including kind of triaging to the hospital versus outpatient referral. And um, that piece is really important. Again, monitoring growth and development is hugely important. We're even getting more data about kind of the irreversible aspect of linear height impairment from malnutrition. So um, sometimes just taking a step back and holding that bigger picture for patients and families can be really helpful. And then just establishing clear roles with the team, right? So whether your patient might be in a partial program or working with us in an outpatient setting, and I say stay in your lane, not to detract from your really, really like critically important role as a team member. But sometimes we have really, really well-meaning pediatricians that are undermining the work we do. So for example, right? If you have a patient who, again, maybe started overweight and has lost a bunch of weight, not saying things like, well, actually your BMI is normal. I don't know that you need to weight restore, right? Because that's probably the eating disorder team is going to insist on weight restoration. Or, you know, again, Aaron will speak to this, but FBT, the gold standard therapy for, um, for anorexia and eating disorders is really hard and it's not warm and fuzzy in the beginning, right? So as a pediatrician, I think sometimes we, we want to hold our patients really close and say, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like you have a great relationship with your therapist. Let's get a new one. Right. But actually in, in some ways that that's kind of purposeful um, at the beginning of our treatment. So, so just to know those pieces and, and to be mindful of really working and collaborating with the team so that we're all messaging in the same way is really important. Amanda, there was also a question about um, RFID for our little guys, like five and six-year-olds, which I feel like you probably see more of those patients than we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just thinking about, you know, medical management for those patients and resources yeah. in the community for yeah. therapy and OT and you yeah. know, the various other things that we try really to help together. Them. And actually our program doesn't see folks that young um, because they tend to be more like occupational therapy referrals. That's exactly right. But um, another resource I'd be happy to send out is a list of books, um, podcasts, vetted websites, um, and, and Bay Area referrals for things like occupational therapy and therapy um, specific to ARFID because I know that's a really tricky diagnosis. Yeah, happy to send that out too. The other question I think um, is comes up for people when we're having these discussions about, you know, what, what we do in terms of um, promoting healthy eating, eating habits is, you know, well, if you have a patient who uh, has obesity, what do you do? You know, yeah, how do yeah. you, you know, what, what are your pearls of advice, you know, so that we're not, you know, kind of triggering disordered eating, but you're helping them to implement some healthy lifestyle changes. Yeah. And this is really an emerging area of research. So I'm not sure I have a perfect answer for you, but for the sake of time, I am going to hopefully someone Lauren or someone can facilitate. Um, I'm going to send you this, this paper from pediatrics that most people refer to when they're struggling with this exact issue. Um, it's a, it's a great paper with tons of pearls um, in that arena. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so just a quick nod to, to medicines um, in treating kind of core symptoms of eating disorders. I will say really evidence is so, so minimal. It's difficult to recruit for these studies, right? Eating disorders are egocentric. Patients don't want to take medicines that are going to cause weight gain. It makes sense. Our patients are also medically fragile. Um, and so, you know, starting a medicine can be a little bit hairy in terms of their medical status. We know that some just frank nutritional deficiencies actually affect medication response. So interestingly, if you're seeing anxiety or depression, it's not wrong to start an SSRI, but when a patient is underweight, they actually don't produce enough serotonin around their cerebrospinal fluid to be able to mount a response to that medication. So SSRIs actually aren't aren't all that effective in our population. And remember that malnutrition itself causes really impressive anxiety and depression. And so our, I'll go back to, to food as the best medicine, at least at the, the onset of treatment. And what are we even targeting, right? These, these 
illnesses are so diverse and heterogeneous in terms of how they affect young people. There's just not a really clear target for the use of medications um, in these patients. So hospitalization criteria are all over the website. So I, I will just fly through this, but I will say it's never wrong to give us a call if you're concerned um, about a patient. We have folks on call 24 seven that are happy to talk with you about any case at any time. Um, and so please, please call us. That's never the wrong answer. Um, things we hospitalize for across the board though, bradycardia less than 50 um, while they're awake is, is almost always an indication for admission, low blood pressure or hypotension, um, and certainly hypotension hypothermia. Orthostasis is um, in some ways the, the most finicky criteria. And because of the unbelievable amount of patients we have seen during the pandemic, we're actually not always able to admit based on this criteria. But again, uh, absolutely a reason to call and discuss with us because orthostasis is a reflection of malnutrition. You actually lose smooth muscle around your vessels that are responsible for squeezing blood back to the heart and to the brain. Um, and then actually just severely low weight can also be a criteria for admission. Again, I would ask, don't, don't so much bother with calculation of that median BMI, um, but just look at those historical growth curves, both weight and BMI. And if they're like 75% of what they should be based on historical growth curves, that's also a reason to give us a call to discuss hospitalization. Some other reasons that we get really concerned and would potentially hospitalized, just prolonged food refusal, that, that incidence of hypoglycemia goes way up and that's often a risk we're not willing to take. Any EKG abnormality, certainly um, low potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium, glucose, again, all things that, that um, can result in death. And so we take really seriously. And then other acute symptoms, syncope, esophageal tears from purging, intractable vomiting, hematemesis, right? Those are all complications we see not infrequently um, and, and definitely could be an indication for hospitalization. So, so again, please do give us a call. That on to you, Erin. Okay, great. So I think um, many people know this uh, cognitively, but it, it is a lot harder, I think, in practice to, to really fully embody and understand that eating disorders are really an equal opportunity diagnosis. Um, they transcend race, ethnicity, gender identity, gender, sexual orientation, age, SES, uh, you know, body shape and size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of research on um, kind of prevalence rates of eating disorders. And um, we know that a lot of the research that's been done, unfortunately, for people with eating disorders and um, for young people with eating disorders has been done in predominantly white and higher SES samples. But that really does not reflect uh, the, the general population of people who have eating disorders. And, um, and certain rates of certain eating disorders are actually higher among racial and ethnic minorities. So just being mindful of the fact that um, when somebody walks into your office, um, you know, because they think these preconceived notions about eating disorders can be so strong, even when we know that they're not true, I think there is a little bit of a, of a bias there. And so being mindful of, of that bias and the role that it might play in and you're thinking about, you know, screening for assessing for eating disorders, because um, I think it probably affects all of us in various ways. I think sometimes eating disorders are thought of as disorders that are, you know, not, not terribly common, right? They're kind of a little bit more rare. Um, screening for depression may be something that's kind of more on the radar for a lot of pediatricians. Um, I think, the, you know, these data are now a little bit old, but still kind of helpful in terms of understanding what the prevalence rates of eating disorders. So if you see that light blue line um, kind of across all eating disorders, you know, it's above 10% of, um, of people who, who uh, meet criteria for an eating disorder. Obviously, some of the disorders that we were focusing on a little bit um, more and that Dr. Donnie was talking about in terms of, you know, anorexia, atypical anorexia, um, those are not quite as prevalent, but we're, you know, we're still seeing, especially with the um, inclusion of atypical anorexia now in the DSM-5, um, you know, between three and 5%. Um, so I think these rates are, are, even though these are a bit outdated, um, you know, it, it's certainly not uncommon. So thinking about um, how we kind of screen for these kids. So um, behavioral, oh, sorry. I'm kind of struggling with uh, trying to see what on my, is on my slides. <laughs> so um, treatments for uh, young people with eating disorders, we really emphasize, at least initially in treatment, on behavioral recovery. 
And I think sometimes this is really hard. It's hard for providers. It's hard for families. It's hard for kids. Um, I think they often feel like, well, when does the actual therapy start, right? When are we going to start focusing on the body image or the, you know, the, the severe distress around food? How, how can they get better from the eating disorder until we're really focusing on those things? In this case, um, it, it feels a little counterintuitive, but the cart really does come before the horse. So unless someone is engaging in healthy behaviors around their eating and, um, and, and uh, really kind of tightening up the wall around the eating disorder, there's really no way that that insight or cognitive change can happen. So initially, especially for people um, who are young, we really focus on behaviors and behavioral recovery. We're not focused on trying to help, help young people understand that what they're doing is an issue, Sometimes they really believe that and they buy into that and there's a lot of motivation there. And sometimes they really don't, but we don't let that get in our way of really helping them to, to, you know, kind of manage and put some structure around healthy eating behaviors. People shouldn't be eating, you know, every moment across the whole day, nor should they be going for super long stretches of time. So initially in treatment, whether it's for binge eating disorder or some of the, the restrictive eating disorders, we're really focusing on consistency structure and flexibility in terms of the foods that are being eaten. For um, young people that we work with, a lot of the approaches that we use um, across ARFID, um, binge eating, uh, restrictive eating disorders, bulimia, um, they're, they're very much based in family. And this is really important because, you know, young people are really based in their families. I think um, at a time when they're really trying to individuate and they're developing their social identities, you know, there is a lot of focus on their independence and how they're sort of, you know, moving, moving into a different phase of their, of their development. Um, and I think when it comes to eating disorders, even though they may be very independent when it comes to managing academics and social relationships, et cetera, I think for most young people with an eating disorder, they're really not able to take the steps that they need to to recover, even when they say that they really want that and even when the recovery is incredibly high and they're, they're very much invested in making that happen. Um, we find that those, those individual approaches are much slower. So family-based approaches are really best supported right now by the evidence. And we know from some of the research that's been done in family-based approaches that actually family functioning, even though we're not directly targeting that as, you know, one of the mechanisms of action, actually improves in the course of treatment. Um, and, uh, and these treatments really help to improve and reduce kind of adolescent eating disorder thinking, um, even though we're not directly um, targeting that in some of the treatments that we offer. Um, like I think Dr. Downey alluded to, sometimes when we're really quite firm and we're setting a structure around what treatment should look like and a structure to really help to contain and, and eventually really kind of quash the eating disorder. Um, sometimes kids don't have a lot of rapport <laughs> in, in that therapy relationship, at least initially. Um, it can feel really out of sync with what their goals are. And, um, and, and I think there's some young people who we see who sort of, they get it and they know that this is what they need to get well and they don't really like it, but they sort of get that this is, this is part of the deal. Um, I think some other young people who we see are really pretty upset at the beginning. And so they may not like us very much. Um, that's, that's not to say that the treatment isn't going to work. Um, and we continue to really do our best. And in most of those cases, that rapport really does come around. Um, but uh, um, sorry, Amanda, I was just looking at your message, but I, yeah, hopefully we're still on, are we still on the behavioral treatment? Yes, for adolescence that's slide? right. Aaron, okay. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. There, there's just one question, um, which I think is timely. What advice do you have for older patients, like transitional age youth who might be living on their own without caregivers involved? How do you, what's your approach there? Yeah, I think that really depends. I think for some, for some young people who we work with, um, kind of in that age range, they really, they, they want, they know that they need some extra support. And so we've had partners participate in treatment. Um, we've had siblings participate in treatment. We've had parents participate in treatment, even, even when that young person isn't actually living at home. Um, I think the way that that um, collaboration works, though, is, is sort of dependent on what that person needs. So sometimes it's just, you know, dinners are the most difficult time. And so it's finding someone that they can, can still eat dinner with who sort of knows what's going on, who can help to support them and challenge them a little bit or um, just be present for them if they're having a lot of distress after meals. So we, we, we still involve family. And I think we, we define family in a very loose way. It's, 
you know, who's in the home, who's available, who's in their life. It may not necessarily be their biological family. They may have other people who are very close with them and are very big support. And so we really take a very inclusive role of, you know, who is the family and how do we involve them in treatment? It's a great question. Um, okay. So treatment goals for eating disorders really focus on um, weight restoration for our patients who uh, are kind of below where they had typically been tracking or weight stabilization if they had been gaining a lot of weight or, um, you know, had been starting to lose weight is just keeping them kind of, you know, uh, kind of normalized. I think there was a question earlier about, you know, what if someone loses a lot of weight and then they develop binge eating and then, you know, and then they have kind of a course of binge eat for kind of full binge eating disorder. And now they're on kind of a trajectory of rapid weight gain. I think it's really tricky when, when kids start to engage in dieting behavior and they're losing, you know, weight and they're losing weight quickly, you know, the body really kicks into gear. It really doesn't want to lose kind of the weight that that, that person was set at. Um, and so sometimes, it, you know, binge eating is, is a natural um, consequence of, of engaging in that restriction for a period of time. We really focus, you know, even though we're talking about weight and that is a context of some of what we focus on, we really focus on normalizing eating patterns. So if someone is gaining, you know, rapid amounts of weight, I, I think what's beneath that is, is eating patterns. And so we don't focus so much on like what's happening with the weight number, although obviously that's a helpful indicator for us of what's happening with eating patterns, we're really focusing on, okay, well, what are the eating behaviors looking like? What are eating patterns looking like? And how can we help to ensure really regular, sufficient, flexible, um, uh, structured, you know, eating patterns? And if we're able to do that successfully, we normally find that weight stabilizes probably where that person needs to be. But if they continue to engage in any sort of restriction or restraint, that binge eating will continue to occur. Um, they'll continue to gain weight because they're, they're you know, they, they can't go for five hours without eating. And so the binge eating continues and their weight gain continues. Um, so I think fo really focusing on eating patterns is, is one of the main things that we're doing in treatment, um, whether it's binge eating or, you know, restrictive eating disorders. We're also really trying to, you know, kind of, you know, keep, keep binge eating and compensatory behaviors, reduce those and eventually eliminate those over time and really trying to improve, you know, body weight and shape concerns. Sometimes people kind of take it much further um, than other peers. You know, it's not unusual for adolescents to be really concerned about their weight and shape, right? All of their peers are talking about that. Like that's a pretty normative thing, I think, in that age range. Um, and some of our patients realize that that kind of engagement for them is really tricky and could be a big trigger. And so they sort of take it a step further in terms of really working on their own acceptance and kind of shape, shape and weight acceptance. And um, that's a really protective factor if they're able to do some of that work. So weight really is just one aspect of recovery. I know, you know, we're sort of focusing on it in terms of, you know, growth patterns, um, but it does often coincide with a recovered mind state. So when we see that someone was, you know, always tracking at the 75th percentile and they lost, you know, a huge amount of weight and maybe they're back, you know, down to the 25th percentile and we get them back up to the 50th and, and you know, some people may say, oh, well, the, you know, they're back kind of on a regular growth curve or they're back to the, you know, median or whatever. Um, what we often see is that they're really not recovered from a, a mind state because that's not where their body had tracked before. And it's not really where they're, um, where they're able to sustain a healthy weight by engaging in normal eating behaviors. So if someone is weight suppressed, then I think Dr. Downey shared some of these data, um, you know, it, it really is kind of reinforcing some of these disordered eating patterns that got them to this place, even if things look more or less normal. I think the thoughts and behaviors that they're engaging in are usually not. Um, so we do use it as kind of one aspect of what we look at. But uh, again, we're really looking at kind of the mind state. And if the mind state is in a really good place and behaviors look really healthy, that's a pretty good indicator to us that, that they're in a good place. Uh, but typically, if people are not back on their growth curves, we don't generally see that happen. So family-based treatment or FBT really is the first line therapy for young people with um, anorexia nervosa. And even though it's not really been very um, extensively studied for atypical anorexia, atypical anorexia nervosa, we, we really use the same approach for those young people. Um, for bulimia nervosa as well, this is kind of the first line. We do have additional options, I think, for bulimia. Um, you know, we, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, 
um, can also be effective for these patients, but it doesn't work quite as fast. And, um, and I think uh, because of some of the medical complications, we really want to go with the first line therapy where we can, um, because these patients make a lot more progress in, in family-based treatment. Um, FBT is much faster at helping with weight gain. Again, this is really critical to minimize some of those medical consequences and, and also some of the psychiatric consequences that come along with eating disorders. Patients spend, spend much, much fewer days in the hospital when they get access to FBT um, when compared to other family therapies or other um, individual adolescent therapies. Um, so it's, it's much better in terms of keeping them in their lives. And one of the things that we really like about FBT is that we're really working with families in their real setting. So um, we're not kind of removing the young person from their environment, taking them out of school, putting them in a program or, you know, something else where they may be learning some skills, they may be making some progress, but then when they go back home and they have to face kind of the set of stressors that they have in that environment, it, it feels like they're sort of trying to learn these skills all over again. Family-based treatment typically takes about 12 to 20 uh, sessions over about six to 12 months. Um, we do use it across the diagnostic spectrum um, to restore weight and or decrease binge eating and purging. Um, I think for, for people with binge eating disorder, um, sometimes we, you know, we, we always involve family, but we may be doing more kind of individual approaches, you know, with, with someone who is motivated and, and wants, you know, wants some help with, with binge eating disorder. Um, but we're, we're, we're always involving families. So even in individual approaches, families are really pretty actively involved. Parents are initially really charged with renourishment. Um, and so we do ask them to kind of, you know, step in and really take over decisions around food and eating and frequency and types of food. And, um, you know, they really start to make those decisions, I think, because uh, when someone is so malnourished and, and they're really in an eating disordered mindset, it's just, it's just too difficult to ask them to be doing, you know, to, to be doing some of that work. Um, so for a lot of patients, they actually report it's a big relief for someone else to be making those decisions. They don't have to feel guilt as guilty about it, even though it may be very challenging for them. Um, so we really ask for caregivers. And again, when I say parents or caregivers, this really, this is who is available to the young person. It may not always be, you know, the, the, the parents in the home. We don't necessarily focus on um, kind of psychological issues, like, you know, um, kind of weight and shape concerns at the beginning of treatment, although we do think about those things as kind of maintaining factors and address them more kind of in the latter stages of treatment. We also don't attempt to foster a readiness for change. Um, we really do think of food as the medicine. That's the primary. A lot of these things that we see, you know, OCD symptoms, anxiety, depression, um, other kinds of issues that come up really do improve in the context of good nutrition and, and weight restoration when that's uh, indicated. So we, it's okay if the patient is not really ready to make the change. That's why we're asking their family to step in to help them. And, um, and they usually kind of, you know, get on board with the process um, as they start to get better nourished and they're able to think more clearly. Externalization is, a, I think, a really, really important piece in eating disorder treatment. And so um, really trying to take the blame away from the young person, that it's not that they're, you know, trying to be sneaky or manipulative or that they're trying to wreak havoc on their family or that they don't care about, you know, the, they, they're in and out of the hospital and their family just, you know, I think uh, when they don't understand externalization, it will feel like, well, you know, they're just being sneaky and she's lying to us about what she's doing. Or, you know, well, he didn't, he didn't let us know that he woke up at 4 a.m. to go running. <laughs> no. So we, we use a lot of externalizing language. Yeah, the eating disorder, you know, will get your son to do really sneaky things. Um, it's not them that's being sneaky or manipulative, but it's really the eating disorder. I think in the interest of time, I'll try to breeze through the, these last couple. Um, CBT, when FBT is not an option, is, is also a, a viable um, treatment for many of our patients with eating disorders. Um, it involves a lot more work from the team. Um, we kind of develop a case formulation together. We are, you know, working with them on establishing really regular eating and thinking about kind of the types of foods that include in that. Uh, we still take weights in this model in, in the same way that we do in FBT, and we, we talk about the meaning of that and and kind of what people expect for their weights, oftentimes our patients will say, oh, I know I gained at least three pounds, right? And they're actually down a pound. So that's a big part of CBT is really kind of understanding what they're doing and, and what their thoughts are about um, what might happen with their weight. 
Uh, this is just an example of a self-monitoring form that we would use in CBT, um, the kind of work that we might be doing with young people. Um, I think I'm going to probably skip this because I see questions coming in in the chat and I want to make sure that we have some time for that. But um, I think the last, the last piece that I want to leave people with is that these treatments really, they work well. FBT, we know, has recovery rates of about 50%. Um, more than that have significant improvement in the context of treatment. Um, but the recovery rates are much, much lower for other treatments. And so it's part of why we, you know, when FBT is a feasible uh, treatment to do, we really opt for that because we know that it works much better than some of the other treatments that we have available. And the relapse rates for eating disorders are incredibly high. And, um, you know, we know that people, um, ha you know, have relapses, they may need to be, go back into the hospital. And so we do want to attack these disorders, you know, pr pretty aggressively when we can and get, bring in all of the support that we can um, from the beginning of, of treatment. Um, let's see, I think my thing's froze. Okay. Um, and we do a, a, obviously a lot of really good collaboration. I think Dr. Downey spoke to this piece of, you know, there's multiple team members involved because there's lots of different pieces that need to be managed. And so um, finding ways to make sure that everybody knows what their role is and, and that we um, communicate together about what to do. Um, but I'll just end on a note of hope that recovery is possible. And, uh, you know, we, we, I think we feel really gratified when we work with these, these patients and even sometimes when we're not really sure how things will go and, and uh, you know, our young people are just so resilient and um, it's, it's really amazing to see them um, kind of work through some of, some of these big challenges. Okay. I haven't paid attention to the chat, Amanda. But yeah, I'm <laughs> I don't know. If there's some really, there really nice questions for you in the chat, um, if that's okay, Lauren. Yeah. Um, Erin, do you recommend that the patient also consult with like an individual therapist in tandem to FBT to address the psychological issues? How do you guys approach that? That's a great question. I think it really depends on, on what other issues are going on. So if someone needs kind of, you know, full, um, uh, like a full course of uh, exposure response, response prevention for OCD, that, you know, that, that I think is a really important piece that if, if, if we can incorporate that into the therapy that we're already doing, we don't want to hold up, you know, that progress. And so oftentimes there are disorders that we feel like, yes, actually this needs separate attention. Or if someone is um, uh, receiving gender treatment and they have a therapist that they're working with, you know, on some of those issues, we, we're not going to kind of stop that work. But I do think it's really important if there's two therapies going on at the same time, to make sure that those providers are clear about what, sh what each of them is going to do and that they don't step on each other's toes. So it is a little bit tricky. And I think as a general rule, we, we recommend that people kind of stick with one treatment provider and one treatment model ideally, but there are absolutely cases when it makes sense for multiple, multiple treatments to be going on as long as they have really clear and distinct purposes. And Erin, you alluded to this briefly, but um, another question, any suggestions for how to approach body acceptance in transgender patients with eating disorders? Really tricky. Yeah, it is really tricky. I think, um, I think a lot of the work around that is very individual mm -hmm. and very much, you know, in keeping with what the goals of that person are, right? And so what are the pieces that are really challenging, for, you know, most challenging for them there may be some of some things that we can actually help with medical treatments for, and there may be some pieces that are really not necessarily going to change. And so figuring out kind of, you know, which ones we might be able to actually help with, with, you know, actual medical interventions, which versus which ones we might have to figure out how we can, you know, lean towards more acceptance or other strategies for helping them to cope. Um, because I, I think so, some of the patients who we've seen, um, we're like, well, I'm not willing to do this if this is going to be the outcome, you know, in terms of how, how weight redistributes on somebody's body. We, we don't really have control over that one. Like, that's not one that we're going to be able to help with. Um, but we can help with strategies for how they kind of cope with what that means about them and how they interpret, you know, their, their gender and, and how they feel about that. So I, I think a lot of that is, is kind of, you know, work that we might do in therapy if, there, if there's not something medically that we can do to help. Uh, to piggyback off that, another part of that question was thinking about resumption of menses, so medical markers of maybe weight restoration in, in trans patients, and that's also very individual depending on the goals of the patient and the family. So, you know, if we can't use that as a marker because maybe they're on... Um, 
you know, um, anarchal suppression or, or whatever, we'll use other markers of health. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's also okay to validate how real that dysphoria is, which we maybe wouldn't do in a patient with AN who's, um, gender aligns with their birth assigned sex. You know, I think it's okay to name that that gender dysphoria is real and distressing um, in the course of treatment. Oh man, guys, there's so many good questions. <laughs> we, need, we need another hour. We need another hour. Um, hey, Erin, how about any recommendations for online FBT resources for folks who are in rural areas or otherwise don't have access? Yeah, does that mean uh, uh, resources for providers or resources for uh, patients? Um, it, it, online FBT resources. So maybe you can speak to both quickly. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are, you know, one of the things that we're doing right now is really trying to improve training for uh, providers in FBT. And so we, uh, we're actually just starting to recruit for a study that is providing training to providers um, in a couple of different ways. Uh, again, trying to increase access for providers to understand more about this treatment and to be able to offer it to their patients. Um, I think as far as resources for, for patients themselves, we have a whole list of um, uh, kind of areas, uh, books and online websites that patients and families can go to to learn more about this treatment model and, and maybe figure out some questions to ask their providers about or, or even if their provider doesn't offer FBT, ways that they might support some of the work that they're, they're trying to do at home. Um, so I, I think it sounds like we have a, a few resources to send to, to Lauren after this um, that, that she can send out to everybody and share. Yes, thank you both so much. We'll have, we'll send we'll we'll get the resources from you guys and send that send that out to the group. Um, and one maybe a couple of questions that you can address on this. Um, somebody was wondering about kind of a little bit of an example of like some of the nuts and bolts of uh, FBT. Like, are they scheduling meals or cooking for the patient? And then, are there particular like uh, set goals for like weight gain at the next visit or eating a certain amount of food by the next visit? Yeah, great questions. Um, so typically in FBT, we're shooting for about two pounds per week. Um, and one of the reasons that we, we do, and it seems like a relatively rapid um, gain, and we actually know that early weight gain uh, is, is a pretty strong predictor of remission at the end of treatment. So we're generally shooting for about two pounds of, of weight gain per week. Um, we don't, we, you know, we don't personally prefer, <laughs> prepare foods uh, for, for patients, but we, do, but we do help families to figure out how they will prepare food um, and what kinds of meals they might make that will really help with weight restoration. And we do actually schedule a meal in the context of FBT. So we understand more about what kind of challenges are coming up at home around meals, how we can support parents around kind of navigating some of those challenges and, and how to help, help them to be a better support to, to um, the young person who we're seeing. And, and yes, we do set kind of treatment goal weights or target weights. Um, and that's really based on sometimes our dietitians help us with that calculation, but it's really just based on their historical growth curves and where they should be. And then of course, accounting for, depending on how long the young person has been ill, kind of expected growth and development during that period. Um, thinking about, you know, normal adolescent growth, right. Where they should be gaining three to four pounds a year. A lot of which is um, bone mineralization and, and even um, further like brain synaptogenesis and pruning and all of that good stuff. So um, we, we factor those pieces in, in addition to how active they are and, and other metabolic demands, but we do set target weights. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. I'm afraid we're, we're out of time, um, but thank you both. This is clearly such an important topic and one of, um, you know, huge interest and need for, for our pediatricians and families, um, clearly really um, engage the group. Thank you. And this is the, the last webinar of this year's series. Um, so I want to thank all our participants for coming and, and participating and having such great questions. And our next series will be starting on July 14th. It'll be um, Thursday, July 14th from 12 to 1. And that's going to focus on ADHD.